Thank you for downloading this Device Talks podcast. I'm Brian Johnson, publisher of Mass Device, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Martin Fitchett. He's the global head of research and development for Johnson & Johnson's medical device business. Martin, thank you for joining us. So Martin, you've been at J&J &J since 2000, so 15 years. How long did it take you to sort of grasp the full breadth of the company? <laughs> Longer than I hoped. <laughs> um, it's interesting, I mean, J&J, &J, it's a broad-based healthcare company yeah. for a reason. Um, it can be seen by our size as, as quite a complex organization. When you boil it down to it quite simply, uh, it's uh, three major sectors, mm -hmm. consumer, uh, medical devices, and pharma. And um, despite our best efforts, often in the past, it's been quite difficult actually for not only joining the company to negotiate a way around it, but probably much more importantly for potential partners and customers to do that too. Right. We've been making a huge effort recently to make that a much easier process. I think talking about negotiation, one of the things which we set up about three years ago were these, um, these actual bricks and mortar institutions called the innovation centers. Right, and that's the, those are, you have them in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Menlo Park. Menlo Park, and then China is the other one? Shanghai, and one more. Shanghai, uh -oh. And London. London, yeah. London, yes. With some satellites as well, so Haifa for right. its great medical devices hub, and also um, some other areas in Southern California as well. Absolutely. The point of the innovation centers was we decided we had to be an organization that to be successful, we had to be agnostic to the source of innovation. Right. We just had to understand, partner with, and be where the best innovation was. And it involved a little bit of humility. I don't think any organization, no matter how good, can possibly profess to own uh, the best innovation in every single area it wants to work in. Right. Um, we are very good in many areas, but we understand that there's a great deal of expertise in science, medicine, technology, and engineering out there mm -hmm. that we'd like to access and partner with. Right. Does it bother you when you hear that big companies can innovate? I don't think that's true. Yeah. I think big companies can innovate. I just think they need to have an open mind in innovating in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, historically, big companies got along just fine innovating with the, the, the typical organic internal R&D. That still works quite well. Yeah. Um, certainly works in pharma, where I originally came from, and I think it's been successful in devices. But I don't think it optimizes innovation. I think if you want to optimize innovation, you've got to be very honest with yourself. You've got to say, what am I good at mm -hmm. internally and organically? Where's my expertise internally? What are our technology strongholds? What are our platform strongholds? Where do we want to go? And do we have everything we need to get there? Right. Sometimes you don't. And sometimes you just got to have that intellectual honesty to say, it's time to partner, or it's time to seek that capability outside and bring those together to, to build the best solution for patients. Because you always start with a problem, the medical or surgical problem, and you work back. Right. And you find the best technologies and the best science and medicine to meet that problem. You don't start with your own technology and try and force fit it to solve a problem. That would be a very bad thing to do. Right. And it's been done before, of course, where companies haven't had, I think, the ability or the cultural agility to have an external focus. What were the discussions, were you involved in the discussions uh, prior to three years ago when you opened these centers? Was it, uh, I mean, was it, was it, was it like the result of hand wringing? Were you guys doing like deep internal uh, auditing of yourself? I mean, yeah, what? no, it, 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 I was there. Say humility, but maybe tell me a little bit more about. Yeah, no, I was part of that. Um, now, this was mainly in the pharma business, mm -hmm. so we're here to talk about devices, but I'll just give you a little bit of a history of how we set that up. When uh, Paul Stoffels became head of, of Janssen, our pharma arm, and he's now the chief science and technology officer for the whole of J&J, &J, we got together as a part of his leadership team, and, and really under Paul's leadership and his vision, we knew that to be successful, we had to be much more externally facing in R&D, not just in business, and not just the way we interact with our customers, but much, much earlier. Mm -hmm. We had to have more shots at goal um, in earlier stage products because we know there's a very high attrition rate in pharmaceuticals. There's an attrition rate in devices, but a much lower rate. At that time, we said, unless we do this, unless we, we're actually very, very open and honest about where we have the best technologies and where we don't, we are not going to be as successful as we can be. We knew we wanted to be a very successful, if not the world's most successful pharmaceutical company. And I think Janssen's recent results of probably proven Paul's strategy was a good one. Mm. The keystone of that was having an external focus, an openness to the outside, 
and yeah. a truly agnostic culture to the source of innovation. It just has to be the best. That's hard in many organizations where a not invented here syndrome can sometimes be overwhelming. Right. Like, we can do that, why are you going outside? Yeah. But often, we can do it in some areas, but often we can't in most. And having that openness, I think, has really allowed us, I mean, think, to innovate to greater levels. I think Paul was right. And you come, I mean, you were COO of Janssen, but now you're the head of R&D in the device space. What, what led you to make that jump over to this side? Yeah, I think, firstly, j and J is, is, is a healthcare company. Mm -hmm. And although we're divided into sectors, we see our mission in solving disease. And often a disease isn't simply defined by, it's a pharmaceutical solution, it's a device solution, or it's a consumer solution. Sometimes, right. in fact, most of the time, it's a mixture of all of those. Yeah. And I think as, as, as a company, we've come to realize that innovation as a concept, certain cultures agnostic to the source of innovation, driving towards value all the time, consistently advancing the standard of care, whether it's in pharmaceutical, R&D, or medical R&D, they have the same principles right. that at the end of the day will be successful. There are obvious differences in our businesses differences in the way we manage our portfolios, the differences in the risk, the timeline and the investment, we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But the core principles of innovation actually aren't that different. To innovate, you have to add value. You have to think two to three years ahead, sometimes five to 10 in other areas, to understand that your innovation is still gonna exceed what's right. needed and expected by your customers, by your patients and by your surgeons. That concept of always thinking about value always thinking about adding to the standard of care. It's uniform across all R&D. So are you guys thinking about innovation in terms of the disease state rather than say where it tucks into the med tech portfolio or the Janssen portfolio or, or the Synthi, you know, Synthes Depew yeah. portfolio? I think, I think you can't ignore your portfolios. Right. Right? They're, they're there for a reason. They're there because historically you've had strength and expertise in delivering right. what the surgeon, the physician, or the patient needs. But I think strategically, we took a step back and we thought about what are, what are the diseases that we really want to play a big role in solving. Mm -hmm. And in the devices area, it's not necessarily, they don't necessarily overlap with pharma. They, they, they're different from pharma. Sure. But there are some overlaps. And we appreciate that to actually make headway in the surgical standards of care in these diseases, we're probably gonna need to partner across our sectors mm -hmm. and across the platforms within our division. In devices, I think we can put them down as uh, trauma, um, osteoarthritis as, it re as it's related to our, our sports and our joint reconstruction portfolio. Right. Um, uh, electro, the uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, that mirrors well the biosense business and cardiovascular disease, right. surgical oncology, mm -hmm. such as colorectal and lung, um, and bariatric, or what we call it metabolic diseases, where bariatric surgery may significantly impact the course of obesity or obesity-related diseases such as type 2. Right. And I think looking at the disease really helps us look at a much more holistic approach to solving it. A single product is always going to be very important. Yeah. The quality of that, um, the design, the attributes are always going to be important. But I think in the future, we're going to be expected to deliver more than that. We're going to be expected to deliver solutions around that, whether it be pathways of care innovation, whether it be drug device combinations, and I think j and is well suited for that. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be expected to just think that broadly. And these are sort of white space, blue ocean mm -hmm. projects in these specific disease states? It depends what you mean by white space. So well. some people <laughs> say white space is where you don't play. Right. I think white space is where you're not thinking strategically. Right. Okay. So for me, they're not, there's going to be always going to be the opportunity to look at white space for very high value opportunities, assets, products, and technologies. Mm. I don't think we should ever, and no R&D or innovation-based company should ever close their door on that. But we do have a strategy, and we have a strategy that we innovate by. And actually, that strategy can include areas we don't currently play but are still core, but we know we have to play that. Right. So um, I, I would say go with the strategy, make the strategy broad and important enough where you're solving important medical and surgical problems. Don't, don't close your ears or your eyes to white space, particularly where they're very high value, but don't be driven or di distracted by it. You started your career as a surgeon, you said yeah. to me. What, what was your specialty? I was just a general surgeon. General surgeon? Yeah, I did uh -huh. my residency in the UK. So how long did you practice for? Four years. 
I did my FRCS and then left. Yeah, and then you went into... <laughs> I went into pharma uh, R&D, so yeah, it's a strange and convoluted path. And how, here did you, I am. how did you get there? That's, that's Actually, it was an interesting go. story. My next door neighbor was head of an R&D group mm -hmm. for a large pharma company. And, and I'd just done my FRCS at the time, and I was thinking, do I want to continue to practice? Do I want to try and do something different? He educated me as to what you can do in R&D in industry. And the opportunity to actually develop a medicine or something where you interact with the very best scientists in the field, the quality of research is very high, but the opportunity to impact hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people, it was compelling for me. Yeah. So I decided to give it a go, and right. the rest is history. <laughs> do you ever miss that uh, hands-on? I do. One patient to one patient? Of course. Yeah. I, I, I would be... I would be lying if I said I didn't. I mean, there's always that. Um, you always remember the best parts of careers you move on from, and I have very fond memories sure. of my clinical practice. I have some other interesting memories as well of that continuous 72 hour on course. Yeah. Um, they're mixed up, but of course I miss it. But I don't have any regrets about this career choice. It's really a privilege to kind of experience the business, mm -hmm. but also have the resources to do really good quality R&D right. and to take a really ambitious view of, of, of disease. Yeah. And we can do that. Yeah. I mean, J&J, &J, we can take an ambitious view. We can say, this is a problem. Can we solve it? Can we cure it? And in many cases, there is the opportunity to do that. Right. Maybe not alone, maybe not within one sector, but certainly the opportunity to play a big part in that. Right. So in, in traditional med tech innovation, the surgeon as the innovator, uh, are we moving beyond that, or is there still a huge role for... You can never move beyond that. No. I think the core innovator should always be the surgeon. We're looking at surgical process. Of course, we're in areas of devices where it isn't a surgeon um, who is performing the procedure, but say, in Biosense, for example, it's naturophysiologist. So I say the healthcare provider, the surgeon, the physician, or the electrophysiologist, or whoever is undertaking the procedure of the expertise should always be at the core of our innovation. Yeah. And that can be our surgeon design teams, people we work with around our platforms and systems. It can be surgeons that we hire, but we have working within our core R&D teams. But you've also got to complement that with the best engineering expertise. Right. And I think the core biomedical engineers with an intimate understanding of the surgical process along with a surgeon who has an intimate understanding of the patient needs, that's a critical relationship. How, how do you uh, make that for the healthcare worker who's coming up with a breakthrough idea, how do you make it easier for them to find you guys? Or yeah. At no. least not find you, they're gonna find you, but how to engage yep. you? This is where the innovation centers come in. Um, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. We have four innovation centers in the major biomedical um, uh, environments in the world around MIT, around Cambridge, Massachusetts, Shanghai, China for Asia, Menlo Park for Northern California with satellites in the hand in La Jolla, and also the UK and Israel. We have a website which is JNJ Innovation, and, and it's really, it's meant to be a one-stop shop where JNJ mm -hmm. was quite difficult to negotiate its way in to get to the right person of interest. Right. Our innovation centers are deliberately designed. If you have an idea, an innovation, you could be in an academic group, you could be in a startup, you could be a single surgeon or engineer with an idea, you go to one of the innovation centers virtually, you can call them, um, you can visit them actually, you can actually walk in right. with your idea. They are designed to provide you with a rapid triage and assessment and response and to get you connected with the right expertise in our company very, very quickly. It's one of the core ideas. Right. Also within the innovation centers, we don't only have experts in our core sectors in biomedical um, engineering, in surgical devices, in, in pharma. We also have deal teams, we can put together contracts, letters of understanding very rapidly. And we also have JJDC, which is our venture arm. Sure. And they are there side by side, and JJDC works with our innovation centers mm -hmm. who work with us in R&D and basically targeting our investments very strategically in align with our R&D strategy. That's, that's terrific. Uh, do you feel that, I mean, do you ever find that some of these innovators, though, feel intimidated to... To, to start talking to a J and J, thinking, well, maybe they'll just yeah. They're not talking to J and J. They're idea. talking to somebody like me or <laughs> yeah. a colleague. You know, they're, they're talking to somebody who understands innovation. Mm -hmm. They're talking to somebody who has an understanding of what it takes. Mm -hmm. They're talking to somebody who either has an understanding or access to teams who know good science and good engineering and good ideas when it comes to them. We're hoping that they find they're actually talking 
in a very personal way to somebody who understands exactly where they are mm -hmm. and what their needs are. Um, and, and so far, so good. Yeah. We're getting very good feedback reputationally on how the innovation centers are working. We're ramping them up now for devices. And I hope we're going to get just the same kind of response and support we're getting yeah. that we are for pharma. But they're not talking, J&J is there. Yeah. The resources of J&J are there, but they're talking to somebody like them, mm -hmm. either a scientist, an engineer, a surgeon, right. um, or somebody who intimately understands where they are in the innovation process. And our job is to help partner and develop and nurture that um, if a partnership makes sense for us both. How, how do we as observers of the industry kind of put a value on the partnership, say with the, the Google partnership on robotic surgery? Um, you know, I guess there's one devil's advocate side to say, well, here's two gigantic companies that are, you know, just kind of throwing stuff against the wall. Or is this m m much deeper than that? Much deeper. It's well, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it obviously is much deeper. But I mean, how do we... Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you what I think about it. I, I think... Is um, this the start of more partnerships with companies like that? I mean... Yeah. It's, it's a great question. And look, I, I think it's exactly the opposite to what you said. Mm -hmm. We in, in, in J&J, we've been looking at the opportunity in surgical robotics for some time. We see huge opportunity there, but we're actually, we were intellectually honest enough to say, where's our strengths yeah. and where do we need help? We have a lot of strength, obviously, in, in, in the surgical instruments, devices, in, in endoscopic approaches, in an understanding of the care pathway, mm. the surgeon and the patient needs. But a company like Google has an amazing um, understanding and capabilities in machine learning, in integrated analytics, in big data analytics, in integrated imaging, providing uh, very complex large amounts of data in a very interpretable way for the surgeon. Right. So we thought, why don't we work together and complement our strengths? And that led to the, the spin out, the, the, the joint venture that we have now with Google and robotics. So I think it was the opposite to that. Mm -hmm. It certainly wasn't two large companies throwing a lot at something, hoping you, something would appear was yeah. two large companies actually having the maturity to understand where each other's capabilities could complement each other to really advance the field. And last question here, do you feel like as the largest med tech company in the world, it's your duty to kind of continue to push the early pipeline? Yeah, yeah. we have an innovation responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think in med tech, um, we have a responsibility to look after a large base of products that our surgeons rely on every day. We have to continually improve upon those, mm -hmm. innovate against them, maintain high levels of quality, but we also have a responsibility to think beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said why our focus on diseases is so exciting for me, because it gives us the opportunity to think very ambitiously about how a device can really significantly impact one of two things. Either the surgical process, which can be very important in terms of economically for the surgeon or for the hospital, or for the patient experience, or patient outcomes. So those two things are very important things for us to look at for major diseases. So yeah, I do think we have a responsibility to do that, and I'm pretty confident and proud to say that we continue to invest in that area. Great. When did you take over this job? Three months ago. Three months ago? It's going well? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's early days, yeah. but we shall see. Maybe we can meet up in a year. Do you have a personal goal for where you want to take this, uh, take this division, take this project? I do, but I need to discuss it with my team and my boss <laughs> first. <laughs> okay, you don't want to let us in yet. Well, I guess we'll come back and, and talk yeah. about it next year. Yeah, so I, I would love more, to do that. More great projects to go. Well, best of luck to you, Martin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.